The following, the following interview was conducted with Jules Janik, James Troop, Distinguished Professor of Horticulture for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, October 20th, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Professor Janik, and thank, thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, I was born uh, March 16th, 1931 in Mother's Hospital on 15th Street, New York City. Oh. And I'm a New York boy, and I grew up uh, in New York City. Uh, my father was not named Janik, but was named Henry Spinner. And uh, uh, probably he divorced my mother, or my divorced, my mother, they were divorced. And uh, so uh, I grew up um, with just a mother. And she married again, I think it was probably 1936 or seven, to a man named Carl Janik. And uh, I was never adopted by him, but uh, when I was in high school, I realized I didn't have a birth certificate, which I thought was a problem. So I had my name legally changed to Janet. And Jules awesome. Janet has a nice combination it's anyway. So JJ, right? Yeah, JJ. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little about grade school and high school. Yeah. Well, because uh, I went to the New York City school system, and uh, PS started in the Mishola Parkway, a school up there, and then PS 98 and up in Manhattan. We lived in Washington Heights, the upper okay, area of New York. Okay, up in the northern part. And uh, finally I moved to an area that was right across the street from uh, Columbia's Baker Field, the football stadium, so close to Baker Field. We used to go on the top of the rooftops and watch Columbia play, which was interesting. And uh, then I went to Dewitt Clinton High School, uh, which is an all-boys school with 5,000 boys in it, which was interesting. Is it yeah. still is it still boys school or is no? It co-ed? I think it's co-ed now. Okay, it's co-ed now. Yeah, we were a big basketball uh, powerhouse, and uh, one year all our students went into uh, graduated college, went to NYU and City, and they got indicted for throwing basketball games. So we got famous that way. But um, I was I was uh, went to David Clinton High School, and uh, at that time I decided, you know, when you're a kid in New York, you're always asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I had the feeling I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> so I picked agriculturist. I don't know why I did that, but we had a little garden in the summer, and I liked growing plants, and I kind of pursued that direction. And so at the age of 14, that appro- this was 19, uh, let's see, 44, it was 1945. During the war. Yeah, yeah, just the war was on, and they had something called a Victory Farm Corps. You know, high city kids to work on farms because there's a shortage of labor. So to help win the war and to help get into Cornell, which needed farm practice requirement, I went on this program, and it worked. We won the war that summer, <laughs> and I ended up at Cornell. So Where did you go fun. in the summer? You weren't doing gardening in New York City. No, my oh. folks had a little place in a place called Lake Oscawana in Putnam County, and we had a little, okay. little cottage up there. And we used to, so uh, you did your gardening and stuff little up there. Gar- had Super. some tomatoes, so that's, oh, hey, that's, that's how great. I got into it, yeah. Okay. How did you have decide to go to Cornell then? Because of the well, if you wanted to be in agriculture, that was the place to go because the the it was a uh, land grant school. Well, part it was yeah, part well, private, and part yeah. land grant, and so uh, I, in fact, I worked quite a few summers on farms to get farm experience, and and at Cornell in uh, 1947. Okay, and I graduated in three and a half years in '51, and then uh, had to pick a graduate school, and I, Purdue was recommended, and I went there. Okay. There's another interesting point, is my father, Carl Janik, my stepfather, he apparently went to Purdue for a while. He said something about that there was a, an annex in Chicago or something. It wasn't clear, and he never was clear. I, I tried to find his name in the records, but I never could, Janik or Janet Chick. Okay. But he always talked about Purdue, so it was kind of funny that I ended up in a place That's that right. my father... Can you tell us a little about in college? Were there any student organizations, or did you live on? You lived on campus, of course. I lived on. Oh yeah, it was in Ithaca, New York. A wonderful experience. In fact, I'm going there uh, next week to be honored as distinguished alumni. Isn't that good? Very nice. And uh, so I uh, went to Cornell, and uh, I decided I wanted to go into plant breeding. I picked that very early after working on all these dairy farms and chicken farms. I really I didn't want to do that, and so I um, I wasn't in any department. Though I took a lot of horticulture courses, and I took all of the advanced plant breeding classes. Many of the my fellow graduate students became very famous plant breeders, and uh, so uh, I it was pretty well known for that. Again, yeah, it was, and uh, had a good program. Okay. Uh, one of the great stars there, Henry Munger, just passed away recently, and, hmm. uh, which is interesting. Elsie Randolph, a famous geneticist, I took all those courses as an undergraduate. Wonderful. 
uh, and I was in a fraternity, and uh, I had a, a good experience in Cornell, and uh, from there came to Purdue. Good. And then you uh, tell, tell us about Purdue, and then you, that's where you, you stayed on after. Yeah, that was interesting. I came to Purdue, and uh, I got a very nice letter from uh, E.C. Did you come Stevenson. beforehand to check it out before you decided to come here, or did you just arrive? Sometimes people just arrive. I just arrived. Okay. I, just, I remember coming by train. I got off the train <laughs> station, and I said, what kind of town is this? I don't know. In, in, those, in those days, when you got off the train station, it, it looked like the most godforsaken place with a there was a chicken building there across the street. It was, right, exactly. It was measurable. It was, it was really. <laughs> I said, "What kind of place is West Lafayette?" Anyway, uh, E. C. Stevenson, uh, who was a professor, he wrote me a letter and he said, "I didn't have an assistantship, but there's a guy going to be drafted for Vietnam and uh, or Korea." And uh, he said, uh, I, "If you have any gambling spirit, you'll come." And so that letter turned me on. I came here, and the first thing I did is he asked me what I wanted to work on. I said, "Well, I think I want to work on tomatoes." And he said, "Well, everybody's working on tomatoes, but I have this spinach seed here." He said that. Previous was left by a guy named Dr. Al Albert Lors, who had moved to Florida. And he said, why don't you work on that? Well, I had known that there was a graduate student in Cornell who was there when I was there named Thompson. Uh, Tommy Thompson, we called him. And he had done his PhD thesis on spinach. So I thought, hey, I got a contact there. So I thought I'd take that on. And of all things, I started work on the genetics of sex determination in spinach. And uh, I did that for my master's degree, which I got in a year and a half, and then my doctor's, which I got in another year and a half. So I got my Ph.D. in 1954. Right, yeah. And uh, apparently uh, the work was well-received. And as a result of my writing a lot of papers, you know, uh, I was offered a job here at Purdue. So that was the greatest event that happened in my life. Right. Getting a job. Where were you we living when you first came here? What was housing like? Well, we lived in a little, little apartment. Well, when I first came here, you know, I went to my fraternity. We had a, we had a branch of oh, fraternity here. Oh, there was a chapter here. here on campus. chapter on campus, and there was an annex next door, and I lived in an attic somewhere. That's <laughs> a crazy guy named Johnson. And then uh, that year, I got engaged. To Did my, someone you met here? No, no. My house party date in 1948 named Shirley Reisner. And we had an epistolatory romance while I was in Cornell and here. We actually never saw each other for more than a week at a time, I guess, just all by mail. And so uh, she came to Purdue. She hadn't finished. We were married in 52, so lived on Grant Street, to answer to your question, okay. uh, right where the parking garage is. And we had a little apartment. Were there were houses there or buildings? Or were oh, little houses all on Grant Street, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, next door to me was a guy named Millard Plumley, who was, who was kind of famous. In fact, his grandson is on the Duke team now, the Plumley <laughs> twins. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so we lived there, and uh, my wife finished up in a year in speech. At yeah, Purdue? Yeah, speech. And I did all her drawings for her classes, you know. So. <laughs> And uh, so uh, that's where we lived. And then we moved to the black and whites. I don't know if you know about that, but right where there's new campuses were these little kind of World War II barracks. Not barracks, they were kind of two-story buildings. Yeah, right. I've they were very flimsy. And we lived there for a year. And then we moved to Ross Aid, and then we built a little house on in West Lafayette okay. on, on right. Blackhawk Lane. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, you've got a couple uh, of honorary doctors. We'll talk about that later. Um, your initial appointment. Let's, now you're in the department. Oh, yeah, department. okay. So I got this job, which was very full because I had three offers, or three people that were kind of interested. One mm -hmm. was on the Delta of Mississippi, which didn't please my wife too much. The other was in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico. And the other was a bean breeder in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And they all seemed kind of foreign to me, but I was going to probably take one of them, and it looked like I could get the Mayaguez job. But um, <clears throat> as I say, a new position, some new money came in from the government. And it was Here in agriculture. Purdue? Yeah. And agriculture, every place now got a new position as a result of these new funds in 1954. And so I, I was offered a job to be a fruit breeder because I knew nothing about fruit breeding. But my professor had confidence in me. And there was a big program underway here uh, with J.R. Shea in the botany department who was doing this apple scab resistant program in connection with Illinois and Rutgers. Very interesting story. And so I was made a part of that team. So that was another fortunate experience. Right. I brought in pears as well. They had work with pears. And so I got this job, which really changed my life. When I got the position, I wasn't even made an assistant professor. I was labeled as an instructor, which always bothered me. 
So I started out on the instructor level. That's all stopped now. Nobody's hard as an instructor anymore. <laughs> and then out. in two years, I was uh, um, promoted to assistant professor and then four more years associate, and then I think another four years to full professor. So I went, rose through the ranks, and it was very, very good. So in 1962, I guess, I was voted, um, elected to full professor, and I took a sabbatical. And I went to uh, London, and I was at the Galton Laboratory in, in, in London. And then when I came back, uh, a position opened up in the Purdue Brazil project. I'd just been uh, uh, promoted to full professor. I had a salary, by the way, of $12,000 a year, starting out at $5,000 a year. We so put it, it a... in the perspective of the time. Because <laughs> yeah. people, when they, they're, they're a little cautious, you have to put it in the perspective of the time. Yeah, it okay. still wasn't a lot of money. I right. still remember when I started, my take-home check was $363 a month. That's still not a lot of money. Even then, it wasn't. But anyway, I was... Uh, How told... did that... Uh, 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 Viscosa, which doesn't... The, so, the Sosa. The Sosa. Yeah. How did the offer come to you? Was it, there were already people down there, though. Oh, yeah. It we, was had, we had, yeah, okay. Herrick, Homer Erickson from oh. our department was down there, and okay. he was there for four years. And then I was, he was coming back, and I was to take his place, and he was just... All the departments at Purdue were sending people down, okay. and they were sending, what should I say, top people, you know, people, you know, with promise. I guess they thought I had promise, and so I went down to the Sosa for two years, did your family is, go with you? Yes. Okay. My kids went with me. My uh, my kids were small then. And it was, when I think of it, she was, we were out. And the Souza, which was really the sticks. It was a tiny little town in the mountains between Rio de Janeiro and Belo Horizonte. And uh, sh my wife, Shirley, taught them in school, you know, uh, homeschooling. And uh, it was a, it was an experience. We lived in a nice little housing, you know, uh, you called the villa. Help, help. Oh, yeah, we had all kinds of maids and stuff. We had a, a cook. It's hard maid. to take, right? Yeah, it was hard. It was, it was, it was very nice. What was stuff. the language, though, instruction? Was it Portuguese or? Portuguese. We had to teach in Portuguese, and that was interesting. So when I got down there, the first thing I had to do was teach a course that I didn't know in a language I couldn't speak. So if you can do that, I you figured can. that was my greatest accomplishment, teaching a course I didn't know in a language I couldn't speak. And I got through it, and uh, so... Did you have somebody help with the instruction? Yes, we okay. had the Portuguese lessons. Okay, we'll do the translation. Yeah. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. We had lessons, and we just kind of oh, okay. learned it. But, but you, you wanted to learn so bad. And I'm not good at languages, but I was so intense wanting to learn that you, I ended up learning. So you can make the course more interesting for the students. One-on-one, <laughs> on one, right? <laughs> I remember my very first lecture. Okay. I, I, I had decided what to say, and I say, if I got stuck at this point, I'll just read this. And so I gave my lecture, and sure enough, I finished in 17 minutes, and uh, nothing to do. So I took this thing out to read it, and I started reading it, and I realized I didn't know what I was reading. I didn't understand what I was reading, so I decided I'd never do that again. So <laughs> I learned to take, you know, write out the lecture in English, and then just give it in simple Portuguese, and it worked. So. Okay. Then when you came, when uh, you I came was there back, for two years. Okay. Then when you came back, what uh, did you just go back into the department then? Yeah, just yeah. my back department. Okay. Let's talk a little bit door. about uh, the apples and your work in the research area. Well, yeah. it was kind of interesting because yeah. Um, yeah, I got involved in this apple breeding program, which was very interesting. It was started by J. R. Shea, and he was probably forty-six or seven. Uh, he had come to Purdue from Wisconsin. And uh, his department head said, you know, there's a young guy in Illinois named Huff, and he's found some apples that are scab-resistant. Scab is a very serious disease. And it was an old breeding program uh, that started out in 1910, and some projects were floating around on the farm, and he found some lines were segregating for scab. And these two guys got together and decided they would devote themselves to getting apples resistant to scab, because scab is the worst disease of apples. I mean, unless you control it, it's a terrible burden on farmers. Even this was before the fact that there was a war concern about pesticides. But you, you still have to spray 15 or 20 times. And they, they were doing it to make it easy for the growers, not realizing that the important thing was to get rid of these sprays. And so uh, I got involved in this program. And then throughout the years, everybody died, and I'm the one that was left. So I inherited the program. And, uh, and went with it. And went with it, yeah. Right. And uh, sort of harvested the cream, you might say. And now it's... Uh, become a world program that this gene is being used all over the world. These apples become important. And so um, right. I'm when the inheritor you, uh, of this apple breeding program. Right. And of course, that uh, what Apple Gold Rush and Enterprise 
are ones that really... Yeah, they, there are three now that look very good. Gorish is a fantastic apple, and a um, uh, new one, Pixie Crunch and Crimson Crisp. And uh, I think they're going to be winners, but uh, we still haven't hit the big... You still don't find them in the grocery stores. But in Indiana, everyone grows them in Indiana. So oh, okay, okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, the center. That's part of the Center for New Crops and Plant Production? No, no, that was something different. Okay. I, I was working away and uh, working with a guy named Simon, Jim Simon, and we were, were he was interested in herbs and spices, and we got interested in new crops and... Uh, and one day he said to me, I said to him, you know, let's start a center of new crops. <laughs> well, the first thing we did, we ran some symposiums in new crops that became very influential. Here and, on campus? Yeah. Okay. We'll start Noel in, in Indianapolis. Okay. Indianapolis. And eventually, uh, I turned out to be a very good editor. And so I edited the proceedings. And so eventually we entered, had six symposia and proceedings and people from all over the country and the world gave papers. Then we took these papers and put them on our website. And uh, our website got to be enormously popular. And it still now gets something like 30 million hits a year. So it's it's very good. And we have any crop you want. We have a lot of stuff from our conferences. And so basically our new crop center is based on this information transfer from these uh, symposia that we held and information we have on new crops. And but so you have from, people working on new crops as well? Well, or? we did. At okay. one time, I was getting money from the state. We were having research funds. But, you know, it's very hard to, to develop new crops. Yeah, right. But you're People are always talking about it. And, uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, it still has a great deal of interest. It turns out there's no such a thing as new crop. Every new crop is somebody else's old crop. So basically, we talk about new crops as crops that were grown by others and disappeared and are coming back. And, but in any case, this uh, new crop center, or by having this information source, has become a very uh, well-used right. source. And right. uh, this, yeah. this, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the website is called New Crop. So if you just put New Crop, one word on Google, it'll come up one or two, and uh, you can get this very interesting site. Okay. So. Okay. The, this is a very nice congratulatory thing, the James Troop Distinguished Professor of Horticulture. Yeah, that right. was that was very nice. Yes. Purdue has this system of uh, honoring people I think uh, need to be honored by a step above full professor called a distinguished professorship. How did uh, you learn about this? Did someone touch base with you? Well, I think what happened. No, what happened was I was... This has com- been this distinguished prop for a long time, yeah, 1988. Long time. Well, what happened about it in the late 80s, I got a call from California, and they asked me if I would interview for a distinguished professor job in California. And I think my uh, uh, department head was Bruno Moser at the time. I think he thought, he was, we better keep chatting. I guess that's what he said, because he he put me in for distinguished professorship at, at uh, Purdue. And so that's how I got this. And it's a wonderful thing because it comes with some extra funds that you can use. Uh, part, part, a little bit of money went to bu- give me a bump in salary, but a lot of it went to hire um, an associate called Anna Whipke, and she still works with me. And so she's been my right-hand woman, so to speak. Right. And um, so we work together on the Apples and the New Crop Center and a lot of the editing that I do. So right. um, this well, has been very One funny. of the things that you edited was hort- uh, that, uh, the horticulture journal. Well... It turns out that's how I got famous as an editor. Uh, that's just one of many things that I got Yeah, but famous. this is an interesting story because um, it started out when I was a young professor. This is Hort Science, isn't it? Is that the one or which journal? Well, it started with a book, Hort Science. Yeah, okay, yeah. right. Uh, some guy named McCaleb, Harvey McCaleb from W.H. Freeman and Company, came through Purdue and he, he stopped on... Um, Aldo Leopold, not Al, Carl Leopold, who was a famous professor here, son of Aldo Leopold. And he said, I want somebody to write a horticulture book, he said. Uh, would you be interested? And Carl said, gee, I'm not interested. We got this young guy named Janik. Why don't you go and see him? So he came up to me and he said, would I be interested in the book? Well, I'd never taken a course in call horticulture or taught a course, but I thought I could do it. And I said, yes, I would do it. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I can't do it without some help. So I got three people, in the, two other people in the department to help me. Um, and um, they ended up dropping out. And so I ended up doing it myself, which was the greatest thing that ever happened. So as a young man... Uh, in, it came out for a long time. That's yeah, very good. Yeah, 75. I put out this horticulture book, and it was very successful. And at one time, it was the, the biggest horticulture. It came out, went through four editions until I got tired of doing it. So, I, so as a young man, I had written a book, and then I quickly went off to Brazil. 
And in Brazil, the first thing I did was I helped get it translated into Portuguese. And now when I go back to Brazil, there are a whole bunch of people who know me because of the book. It became a very big book in Brazil, and so I'm known from that book. Then that summer, Michaela asked me if I'd put one called World Crops, Plant Science, a plant science book. And so I got three people, including Vern Rattan, who was a famous guy here at Purdue, and we, uh, two others. We, so we put out this book in, um, in plant science, which was also pretty successful. That was the trend from into this plant science area from the different crop areas. And then another very interesting thing happened. We lost our editor of the American Society for Horticultural Science of two journals, which was the uh, Hort Science and later the, their journal. I had two journals, and they asked me if I would be editor. So here I was a very young guy in the early 30s, and they asked me to be editor. And um, I jumped at the chance. I thought I'd be ready to do that. And I turned out I loved doing it. I did it in my home, and Shirley became my secretary. So we had a little two-man yeah. office in the basement of my home. And it was a time before computers, so everything was done by hand. In fact, I used to make up the pages by cutting them out and pasting them. And I just loved doing it. I'd get about 600 papers a year. And I just flourished putting out hard science. And then later, the uh, guys who were running the journal were old and disappeared. And I did both of them. So I did hard science in the journal. And then in the middle of that, this was the time when there was a a book called Annual Reviews of Plant Physiology. It was very popular. Everybody was getting it. I thought, we ought to have annual reviews in horticulture. And so I went to the, my society, which is the American Society of Horticultural Science, and I said, we need an annual review. And as all societies, they say, well, I wasn't going to do it. I thought the society ought to do it. And they had a committee, and the committee met, and they said, well, they didn't think there was enough stuff in horticulture to put on annual reviews. And I said, you're crazy. And to show you how crazy you are, I'll do it myself. So I was editing two journals, and I started this new annual reviews. And then a couple of years later, I thought we would have, have one in plant breeding. So, so I was doing four journals at one time. And so the two journals, Horticultural Reviews and Plant Breeding Reviews, have really got me famous because they're still continuing. One is 37 volumes, the other is 35 volumes. And I have a big bookshelf, and they come out every year. And so I'm well known, extremely well known, because I put out these journals, and so everybody knows Jules Janik. JJ, right? JJ, yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, and this was an article that I read. Remember the horticulture farm we used to sell the apples? Yeah. It was really, really too bad that it closed. It didn't close. It was a very interesting story. And for retail. Oh, yeah. No, no. This is what happened. Because oh. I used to go out there and. Oh, yeah. Stop. We loved it. And we loved it. It was only three, three miles away, and it was very convenient for us to run out there. And all of a sudden, Purdue decided they wanted that farm. They wanted to sell it for was, real estate. It was Purdue's farm, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh. Purdue owned it. So they decided they wanted to sell it for real estate. And at the same time, the horticulture department was going to the hole every year with the budget. You know, we, and finally the dean said, you cannot overspend, and we will not, we'll take care of you this time. And then they made a deal with us. Says, if you get off the farm, we'll buy you another farm in near Throckmorton, see, and... Um, and we'll put the budget under their farm budget so we wouldn't get stuck with these deficits each year. And so we jumped at the chance. Okay. And then Purdue find out there was a dump on the farm and they couldn't build real estate on it. So now they'd kicked us off and they have a farm they couldn't build. And at the same time, forestry needed a farm. There's a new forestry breeding program. So yeah. the farm became a forestry farm. So it's a very funny story. It is interesting. And it's very sad, really, that uh, we stopped selling apples because that was a really connection with the whole campus. Just as, in a sense, the um, the animal science, you sell ice cream, right. which was fun. Everybody used to buy ice cream, and they didn't do that anymore. So. What was the problem uh, later, close, close to the time? The cider, you had to stop uh, selling the cider out there? No, we oh. made cider, oh, but at that time there was a lot of concern about, you know, cider being problems right. and how to pasteurize it. That, that, right. that all got settled out. Yeah, no, I thought so. So we got new machinery and so right. cider. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the, you've got quite a few patents. Yeah. Um, I'll let you make a couple comments on Lindsay Okay, Tuesday. well, about, I forget, around the 80s, a new thing became hitting horticulture, which was tissue culture. Right. The point that you could put plants in tissue culture and they would form new plants. And uh, this was a new way to propagate plants. You could take a little piece out of a plant, stick it in vitro, as they call it. Vitro means in glass. And by applying the right chemicals, it would sprout and you could get millions of plants. So this was very exciting for a while. And uh, the chocolate people, Mars and um, 
Hershey bars and all the sugar companies, they have a company called the Chocolate Manufacturers Association. And they put a little money to helping the cocoa industry, and they realized that one of the problems was all cocoa was planted from seed, and if they could plant from an individual plant by propagating it, this would be very good. And they came upon the idea of using tissue culture. So they called me up and asked if I would do a little research problem on trying to propagate cacao. Well, we tried it and we had some, we had our problems. It was hard to do. But then uh, we had a new guy called Mike Hasegawa come in and uh, he suggested, why don't we just uh, see if we can get somatic embryogenesis. That's an interesting phenomenon. You take a little piece of the plant tissue and you get embryos coming off. It's like a little piece of your, paper, piece of your finger putting a tissue coat and getting babies coming out. And so we, we, we hired somebody, uh, a lady named Valerie Pence, to work on this project. And sure enough, she took some young embryos of cacao, put them in culture, added uh, the right chemical, okay, indolacetic acid, and little embryos popped out. So that was exciting. We thought, well, we could propagate them this way. But the problem was we weren't propagating the tree. We were propagating a seed, and the seed wasn't exactly what the tree was. So it was complications. But then I had a... I thought a brilliant idea. I said, gee, if you can take cocoa seed, you can make a million little embryos. That's what cocoa is. It's the seed. Why don't we take these little seeds that we generate and make chocolate out of them so we could make chocolate in a big fat in Indiana? Well, that looked pretty exciting, you know. And we sold it to the chocolate manufacturers, and we got a big grant, I think it was at the time, which was a lot of money, $500,000 to work on this problem. And so... It turned out we could take these embryos and we could develop them into close to cocoa butter, but we never could do it commercially, and so eventually the money stopped. But that's what was patented. And then I did that with other crops of taking the seeds and uh, growing the seeds to produce what the seed produced. So we, I call it embryogenics. And uh, so a lot of patents came from that area. Yeah. Other patents came from patenting the apples. Right. That's, that's very good. Um, horticulture department, uh, one of the things that you've been involved in, of course, is your curriculum, the courses that you've taught. In, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've taught a lot of courses I since know. I've been here. I in know. fact, I started out as a graduate student. As a graduate student, we lost our genetics teacher. Genetics used to be taught in the animal husbandry department, just okay. before animal science. Okay. And when he left, uh, a couple of us were asked if we would, wouldn't teach genetics. So as an undergrad, as a as a graduate student, I taught genetics, genetics at Purdue, for a year. And um, then, when I, then when I was hired as a department, I, was, I taught my professor's course in plant breeding. So for many years, I taught plant breeding in horticulture. There was a plant breeding in horticulture and plant breeding in agronomy. I tried to get them combined, but I never could do that. And then eventually, I, at one year, I taught plant propagation. And once I taught pomology, when I was in... Um, Brazil, I taught a number of courses in genetics and seed. You taught the seed literature food. course, though. The yeah, then I started that literature course, and that, and of course, you helped me. This, this is when computers were coming in, and yeah. we were doing our literature survey with little index cards with, oh, I know what you know, with, with holes in them. And uh, then we went to the, then you came and we were doing it online, and you and I did a lot of research in that area, right. seeing if that was more efficient than the old fashioned way of going to, the, right. to index cards. And then that morphed into a, a history course, history of horticulture. And then I taught another course. I went on sabbatical to Hawaii one year, and I interested in tropical agriculture, and so I taught a course in tropical horticulture. And then later on, I thought these courses would be really good on the, uh, as a distance learning courses. And Purdue was talking about distance learning, and I thought they didn't really know what they were talking about. And I had conceived of teaching this course. In fact, the photographer here, I think, uh, filmed me once. I would teach it in front of, uh, you know, a television camera. And be, would be Simon Tanley's broadcast to ten universities. I thought that would be really neat. Well, it turned out you couldn't do that because our time system wasn't like anybody else's. You know, we never, we didn't change our time, and other universities did. And so they had a system where they would photograph me. Okay, so they would photograph me and give these films out to the students. That was awkward. And then finally, with advances in technology, they put it on streaming video. <clears throat> and that turned out to be very successful. And so now, of course, I used to have 20 students every year. Now I have 400 students this year <laughs> teaching these two courses. And it's very successful. And uh, so. And you like it. 
Well, I like it. I like it. I like it. (laughs) So this became a... I'm I'm the biggest teacher in horticulture now with these two courses. (laughs) Oh, one of the... We'll talk a little bit about awards and honors. Um, One of the ones that was your distinguished thing, but also you are a fellow in... American Society of Horticultural Science and the Portuguese. Yeah, I, uh, I and you got, got a couple of honoraries from it, Bologna and Lisbon. Yeah, you want to talk well, about that? well, I was made a fellow of our society because mm-hmm. I was editor, you know, as well known. So I was made fellow, and of course, when I was fellow there, I was automatically put into the American Association of the Advancement of Science, AAAS. Right. Yes, indeed. And then I got friendly with some guys in Portugal, and they made me a fellow of their society. So I'm. And I just came back, and I was made a fellow of the Transylvania Horticulture Society. So I'm fellows of lots of <laughs> horticulture societies. Hope all the fellows get together one of these yeah, days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the really is a great thing that happened. Uh, a guy in Italy named San Savini, he kind of followed my career, and uh, he told me that um, Bologna was celebrating the University of Bologna. is the oldest university in Europe, founded in, you know, have a thousand-year anniversary. I was at 800, I can't remember, but it was, it was big. 800 year anniversary of the university. And he said he would like me to be an honorary, uh, honoris causa at that university. So uh, he nominated me, and I went through this wonderful ceremony. What was it like? Oh, it was fantastic. I had two little, they had a campus in Bologna, another campus in another city. And this was, I was in that other city, and there was an orchestra there, and the bishop was there, and it was it was unbelievable. Oh, it was yeah. just. Were you the only one selected? Only one, only one. Yeah, I was at at that time, sure. only in that ceremony, and there was a banquet, and it was just wonderful. Oh. And so I was made an honorary degree from the University of Bologna. I think it was nineteen. Very. Nice. The family go with you? Yeah, I was surely went with me. It was just sure. Yeah, and it was it was really great. And then my friends in Portugal wanted to show that they would do it, and so and. I got one from Lisbon. That was number two. And then uh, 19, I can't remember the years, uh, 19, a few years ago, 1997, I was given an honorary degree in Hebrew University of Jerusalem because I'd done a lot of work with some of my friends in the Volcani and the Hebrew University. And just this summer, I got one in Romania, in Transylvania. So uh, I, I don't know anybody in Romania, but this guy who has followed my career and had my books, and he put my name in. He so picked you up. He picked me up. So I have four of them now, which is kind of nice. <laughs> That's very nice. The uh, American Society for Horticulture Science in the Hall of Fame. In oh, yeah, that was my biggest honor, really. Because, That's very uh, nice. That, uh, that was started by a friend of mine. You know, we, he said, we ought to have a Hall of Fame. And we had guys like Mendel in there and very famous people. And uh, last year... Well, I, it turned out I couldn't be a member because I was still working. They had in the bylaws that you had to be either retired or dead. And I wrote them that I didn't want to do either. And so they changed Not the rules. Not on my agenda. They, they changed the rules, and I was made a member of the, uh, of the Hall of Fame, which was, which was a wonderful thing. It was, it was particularly wonderful because it was in the meeting at St. Louis, and my daughter lives in St. Louis. So um, she was able right. to come. My son, unfortunately, was... Bicycle, bicycle riding somewhere, so he couldn't come. But anyway, my 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 daughter and one of her uh, her husband and one of her sons was there, and it was it was a wonderful experience. It was a very nice affair, and then that big party in the evening, and it was just great. So it's nice to have your daughter appreciate your honors, because uh, usually they don't. Talk you know? about family. You got you have two, uh, your two children. Yeah, married to. I Did was, they I, come to Purdue? No, they, oh. no, no. They, you know, when kids live in West Lafayette, they don't want to go to Purdue. All kids from West Lafayette want to go somewhere else. And fortunately, my son went to Cornell. He was extremely happy to go to Cornell. Wanting to go where Dad was, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, he he wanted to study biochemistry, and it turns out that biochemistry was in the ag school, so it was a great deal. So he went biochemistry and um, graduated Purdue. Did very well, much better than I did. He got straight A's in Cornell, and then. Um, when he graduated, uh, he decided he wanted to continue biochemistry. And I said, Peter, why don't you in biochemistry? Why don't you go in the medical field? Why don't you get a doctor's degree, you know, become a medical doctor? And he said, oh, I don't think I want to do that. But he went to his major professor, or his, his advisor. And that was funny. His advisor was somebody, well, when I was a student, I was babysitting for his kids. <laughs> and he had gotten his degree in medicine. So he um, finally got an award for an MD, PhD program. And, uh, in biochemistry and medicine, and as a result of at he, Cornell, no, no, he okay. went to Duke. Oh, after to graduating Duke. from there, he went to Duke. Okay, for MD, joint. PhD, yeah, and he he, 
And anyway, in the short, long of the story, he's now a, a radiologist in Michigan, in East Lansing. My daughter wanted to go to Cornell so badly, and she wasn't accepted. They made a very big mistake, because anyway, my, she went to Indiana University and then to law school, and now she's a, a deputy clerk at the Eighth Circuit Court in um, uh, St. Louis. So she has also a distinguished career herself, and uh, so that was nice. So my, uh, I have a doctor and a lawyer. You can't do any better than that. <laughs> and they each have two sons, so I have four grandsons, which is very nice. <laughs> Uh, They're the big athletes. My <laughs> uh, one other award I was going to make a comment on was the uh, A.E. Thompson Kerr Award Association from the Advancement of Industrial Crops. Oh yeah, that was in, in this new crops because yeah, well, that's uh, a, really lot nice the, a, a lot of a lot of the these symposia we ran on new crops with with the industrial crops because they're new crops. Sure, and so right. That's yeah. I see. Yeah, I got another nice award. I was in the in the uh, a member of the Indiana. The Italian Academy of Agriculture. How about that? How about that? A corresponding memory. <laughs> I, I have a bunch of these awards. And stuff. You got a wall, wall yeah, full of them. Wall full of them, yeah. Um, Preston Associate, you were president one time in the American Society for Horticulture. Society. Yes, I was. That was a, a great honor. I think it was 1986 or seven, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting experience because uh, <clears throat> the big thing you have to do when you become president of an organization are things you never thought you'd have to do. My big job was getting rid of our executive director, who was going to be a disaster. <laughs> so uh, it's funny. When you become president of an organization, things happen that you never anticipated in completely different I situations. understand that. Yeah, so. And you're also a board, were a board member of the International Society for Horticulture Yeah, Science. I got involved with that. Uh, when I was president of the society, I nominated one of my colleagues to be on the council of this international group. Sure. And then, when, and then eventually I got up to be a council member. And then I was elected to the board is what you think, director of publications. And my big job was putting out their magazine, Chronicle Horticultura, which I really transformed into something quite extraordinary. So now, <laughs> so I carry this editing. This editing is really, yeah. did uh, me a lot of good. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about the archives at Purdue. You, you use the archives. Uh, oh yeah, to- and I had a great experience with the library. I'm very fond of the library. And for this course I taught in literature horticulture, I was looking up something called Gerard's Herbal. It's an herbal written in 1597, and I went to the library to get it, and I thought there'd be a facsimile. But no, we have the original one. So in the attic, there they had this herbal from 1597, and lo and behold, in the back, there are five pages with handwritten recipes, doctor's prescriptions on them. Very (laughs) interesting. So uh, I discovered this book that and it's, it's quite valuable. Eventually, it, they put it in, in the um, pharmacy department. They have a special collection, and now it's in in special collections. For it the was library. over in pharmacy at one time. Yeah, they have a okay. locked case there. Okay, but, right. Yeah. And it was beat up, so they put a new cover on it in the box. And now it's really taken care of in the right. Exactly. Because so, of the um, university archives. That's a famous book that Purdue owns. That's right. Well, we got a few others too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, outstanding event. Outstanding events. You can have plural. You can have more than one. Oh, well, I think my life is an outstanding event. My there kids, you go. You I got go. it. Yeah. How about a Purdue tradition? Well, it turns out what I love about Purdue, two things. There's a song of Purdue I like. It's the the Purdue hymn. Right. I get weepy every time I hear that. I don't know why. When it says sons and daughters, too, that gets me weepy. So I like that a lot. But what I really like about Purdue is WBAA. I listen to BAA all the time. They have right. Continuous classical music. I know I was on the board or something, and they always try to get rid of it. But there's some alumni that says his mother watches it, and they keep it going <laughs> on the board of trustees. So I think uh, the thing I love most about uh, those are nice. Purdue is WBAA, which is wonderful. Nicely said. Continuous classical good, music. Good choice. Okay. Um, let's say a view of horticulture. Uh, anything I forgot to ask, or I'm going to let you make some general comments, or something I left out? Well, uh, at. it's interesting. I'm in the horticulture department, which is kind of an interesting place. All ag Has it always been in that building? Always been in that building. Well, when it was built, I guess, in 1928 or 24, yeah. there was one addition on it. And uh, uh, the horticulture departments are disappearing, combining with agronomy and crop science, but uh, Purdue still has a tradition in horticulture. And our department is number one in the country now. 
and mm -hmm. a lot of because we have a lot of molecular biologists. Why did they uh, decide to tie in landscape arch architecture years ago? How I had something to do with that, which okay. is interesting. Yeah, because when I'll, you came, it was only horticulture. Yeah, so primarily horticulture. Right. And we always, even when I joined the department in 1951, we had two landscape architects in the department. Okay. But they were in the extension service. Okay. <clears throat> and they would design buildings for the 4-H clubs around the state. All right. And um, just before I went to uh, Brazil. E.C. Stevens said he liked me to be a so assistant head or something like that. And uh, he said, would, he, would I help him with the annual report? And I said, you know, okay, but I think what we ought to do is start a hard landscape architecture program. And he took that over. So it was my idea, but he took it over. And so we started this program in landscape architecture, which was very successful. And eventually they felt they needed to to be recognized by a name. So we changed the name from to horticulture to horticulture and landscape architecture. Okay, okay. So I consider myself kind of the founder of the landscape architecture Put that on program. a plaque in your office. Yeah. Right. But uh, go ahead, anything that you would like to either, I, I forgot to ask or you want oh, to. Oh, about right. horticulture. But, yeah, well, horticulture is a very interesting topic. I, I define horticulture as food for body and soul because it has the foods we like to eat, you know, fruits and right. vegetables and herbs for healthy living, and ornamentals and landscape architecture. So it's, it's a very broad field. Also, it's a famous field, because when you think of it, when I think of it, horticulture is the basis of civilization, you know? It's involved with the discovery of agriculture and the domestication of plants and the basic techniques of pruning and grafting. And so it, it really is a, it's given rise to other fields of science, uh, like, like mathematics, you know? Based right, on, oh yeah. And uh, uh, health, uh, one time it was very important in medicine, you know, with herbs and stuff. So it's, it's kind of the mother of a lot of other sciences. And I think uh, it, it's really a lot of the things in horticulture are the basis of civilization. So I think uh, horticulture is a wonderful field for better, betterment of humankind. Uh, and also it's been big in science. The greatest paper in biology is written by a guy named Gregor Mendel, who worked on the garden. He was a horticulturist. So I think horticulture has a real place in agriculture and science and humanities, art. It crosses it, over. Yeah. <clears throat> I might say in the end of my career, I'm working on a new field, is the relationship between art and horticulture and the historical end of it and horticulture and paintings. And so I'm kind of doing a new area on horticulture and humanities, which is very interesting. And, and, very uh, good. So what I'm sort really of enjoying what, that. And what, and what aspect? Well, in a number of aspects. Okay. One is to trace the origin of crops. Okay. So... Uh, where these crops came from, I uh, have to find that from ancient drawings, you know, so from artwork. You can find a lot more in art that you can't find in writing. You can actually see the plant. When you read about it, you don't know what plant they're talking about. But when they draw a picture of it, that helps you out. So a new field called plant iconography, where you study plants through the, the pictures of these plants. Uh, that's one way. And then uh, interested in the New World plants reaching the old world and um, the first pictures of New World plants in Europe. We found that the first picture of maize is in a ceiling in in in, uh, in Italy, uh, in, in in Rome, called the Farnesina. And so uh, I'm having really very interesting time. I just came back from India, and I want to go to India to see the Taj Mahal. So I, I you went there. I invited. The, I invited the the le I invi they asked me to speak in Bangalore, which is up, I don't know, 600 miles away from New Delhi, but I managed to come through New Delhi. And uh, to see the Taj Mahal, and sure enough, it's full of flowers and stuff and stone, you know. And uh, so, on the basis of that trip last year, I wrote a paper on the horticulture of the Taj Mahal. And so, there's a lot of connection between art and horticulture, and right. uh, it's extremely interesting. And I've kind of started a new field, I think, of uh, horticulture good. and art. We're moving forward, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Shannick. This has been very nice. I really appreciate that. Long, our long association. Okay, thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. <clears throat>